Welcome to Candlelight Christian Fellowship. We are so glad you are here with us today. Join us now as we study the Word of God. Would you stand as we worship the Lord?
Jesus. And this is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the Father God, I thank you so much for the word of truth, the word that tells us that you so love the world that you gave your one and only son. Lord, that by his stripes we are healed. Father, with so much hurting in the world, it is a comfort to know that we are held in your arms. Lord, that every ounce of what we go through in this lifetime, you use for our growth and our benefit, being positionally sanctified before you, Lord God, but in this lifetime, made more like you. So Father, I thank you for for the joys, I thank you for the trials, even though they hurt, Lord God, and I ask that you would continue to do your work, which, Lord God, I know you are doing, and I praise you for it. We offer you our praise, our worship this morning, Lord God, and, and throughout the rest of this service, and Lord, throughout our lives, because you are good, you are wonderful, and you are kind, you are, you are a good father. We just love you, Lord. It's in your name, in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Would you please be seated? Hey there, or maybe I should say, g'day mate. Summer is fast approaching, and do you know what that means? It's almost time for VBS. This year, we're taking an exciting journey to the Australian Outback, and we're on the lookout for enthusiastic volunteers to join our team and make this year's VBS an unforgettable experience. Our adventure kicks off on July 15th, but the planning and setup begin in June, and we need your help to bring the Outback to life. Whether you're skilled at crafting, have a knack for administration, or simply love interacting with kids, there's a role for you. So, are you ready to join us on this wonderful and wild adventure? Don't miss out on the opportunity to be a part of something truly special. Sign up online under Serve and then VBS and join our Zoomerang team. Let's make this year's VBS the best one yet. See you in the Outback. Hi, Candlelight family. I just wanted to let you know we are safe and sound in the beautiful city of Jerusalem. We'll be home in a couple of days. We're still delayed, but we have a flight. We have everything scheduled. And we are just so excited to be here sharing with the people today, sharing with you. Frank Figueroa is going to be our guest speaker today. Hey, Frank. I'm sorry I'm not there to be with you, but in the providence of God, we had you scheduled, and God did everything from before the foundations of the world, and we know that you were planned to be there, and I was planned to be here in Jerusalem, where from this place, we go into all the world with the gospel, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful Sunday morning. I'll see you Wednesday night. Our tech guys fixed that for Pastor Paul. 
Good morning. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. Isn't it good to know that Paul is safe and sound and our team has done well? Uh, most all of them are back except for Paul and Brenda and um, and Jeff and Kyle's folks, Dwight, and I've lost their names because I am I have early onset dementia or something. <laughs> Dwayne and Brenda, thank you very much. From the, from the crowd, I'm getting help, the help I need. Welcome this morning. Right now, uh, I want to welcome you if you're a visitor, and this is your first time, and somehow you wandered into our early service. <laughs> Make yourself at home, and before you leave this morning, get a welcome packet on this, uh, from this counter to my right. Get a card out of there and fill it out and let us know how, who you are and help us reach out to you and make you welcome and help you connect. And as you do that, we have newcomers classes available for you. You can sign up for those online and that will acquaint you with us. Then we have membership classes as that comes along and you may decide that you want to uh, connect with us in a more permanent fashion. So all of that is available for you online. I hope you will take advantage of those opportunities. Just now, let's bow our hearts and pray for our three ministries of the week. Father, we are grateful for Pastor Paul Peabody, and we pray, Lord, that your blessing would be upon him and the congregation even this morning as they are gathered to serve you, gathered around your word, gathered to worship. I pray, Lord, that they would be blessed and that you would vindicate yourself among them this morning. Lord, we pray for Stephen, Brenda Hines likewise, and we pray as foreign missionaries that you would bless them, that they would also have your anointing and provision and guidance and direction in every aspect and phase of their ministry as they serve you. And then we are grateful for Kim, our own bookkeeper, and pray, Lord, that as she continues to be instrumental in keeping us accountable and literally in the black, I pray, Lord, that Kim would be blessed and that her family and her home and all of her comings and goings would have your extra help and protection and provision as well. Now, Lord, we lift our hearts up to you in gratitude. We're thankful for salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But we're thankful to know about it. We're thankful to know the truth. We're thankful to know that the truth of all that in your word and how everything that you have said in your word defines that salvation for us, and I'm grateful to have it defended for us even this morning. So in just a few moments, as Kyle introduces Frank, our guest speaker, I pray that you would bless him, and that your word would be set forth before us as fresh bread, even this morning. And we pray and believe all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's get up on our feet and have a brief fellowship break. Greet one another in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening to Candlelight Christian Fellowship's live broadcast. While our church family takes a break to greet each other, we would like to tell you a bit about ourselves. Candlelight Senior Pastor Paul Van Oy desires for all to grow in God's grace through the knowledge of the Lord. Pastor Paul and our pastoral staff are led to speak the truth in love as they teach about life challenges in today's world. The ministry goal is to teach God's word verse by verse and apply scripture in a way that's easy to understand. Candlelight is located in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on the corner of Highway 95 and Dalton Avenue. We would love to meet you here in person, but realize that may not be possible. If you are unable to attend church at the Candlelight campus, please continue to listen or watch online and spread the word about Candlelight's ministry. If you have a request, we would love to pray for you. Email us at hope at candlelight.org or call us at 208-772-7755. Thanks again for listening.
Well, uh, this morning, uh, as you know, you just saw in the video, Paul is still in Israel, and uh, like he said, we have Frank Figueroa here this morning, which we are very excited about. Um, I believe he's been here before, um, so some of you may have heard of him, um, but he is a, uh, with Reasons for Hope Ministries, um, and they are an apologist group, and they, uh, they go around defending our beliefs and giving believers the, the tools needed to defend the faith, because we have a reason for hope, and we have to be ready to share the reason for the hope that is in us. Um, and specifically, they have a big heart for young people, as that's the generation that's going out of the church right now. Um, and so being able to provide those materials is a really big deal uh, for all of us, and that is what Frank is here to help us with and to teach us about. So, ladies and gentlemen, Frank Figueroa. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Or as we say where I am from, aloha. Uh, I, I am actually from Hawaii, just moved to Indiana. And so you know the Lord had to be in it, otherwise there's no way. Um, but uh, just moved to Indiana uh, so I could uh, have the opportunity to work with Reasons for Hope full time. Uh, Reasons for Hope is a basic Christian apologetics ministry. And like was mentioned, we're interested in reaching the next generation and teaching them that they can stand boldly on the word of God. If you are a note taker, raise your hand promise you will get a cramp by the time today is over. We're going to cover over 100 slides in 35 minutes. So all of the slides in their entirety are made available for free on our app. Um, so you can just go to our app and you would be able to get that. And so you don't have to worry about missing anything, even though we'll be moving pretty quick. Does that sound okay with everybody? Today, we're going to be talking about the idea that my identity is my choice debunked. Because that's what everybody's after today is finding out who they are. Where our identity lies. In fact, 78% of teenagers involved in church youth groups stop attending church within two years of their high school graduation. This is fact. We know this. People who are raised in the church. Why? Not because they don't know what it is they're supposed to believe, but they don't know why they're supposed to believe it. And so if you want to break down what Reasons for Hope is about, it's critical thinking based off the word of God being the foundation. And I wanted to start with one of our videos. This is number 22 in our series, our debunk videos, uh, that says it doesn't matter why you believe, debunk. Check this out. From the dead, Abraham Lincoln was an American president. Men can get pregnant. Who? There are indeed married bachelors and who can come to you still on the wall. Did you know all that? Do you believe all that? Do you believe any of that? And the bigger question perhaps is, does it really matter what anyone believes? Well, I guess if you believe it's a good idea to inject love into your veins to cure your arthritis, it might matter to you that somebody steps in, corrects your thinking, and saves your life by stopping you from actually doing such a ridiculous thing. Point is, wrong beliefs can have deadly consequences. What we believe matters. But I have a bigger question than the bigger question that preceded this big question. A deeper question perhaps. Why do you believe what you believe? I ask this because your what can crumble in a second if you don't have a strong why, even if your what is right, huh? Yeah. In fact, a large percentage of people are convinced to change their what, not because their what is wrong, but because their why is weak. Yeah. Go ahead and wrap that up and we'll snack on it in a second. For now, let's consider one of the statements I open with and challenge the what with a why. The moon is made of cheese. True or false? False. Why do I believe that, you might ask? Well, because the moon would be far less dense and therefore the Earth's tides would be extremely different. Cheese would have broken apart and disappeared already, and eyewitnesses have been to the moon and brought back rock samples. No cheese. I could go on and on here, but the take home here is you should have a legitimate why behind your proclaimed what, especially if it's important. Which takes us to another statement, a statement of utmost importance, Jesus resurrected from the dead. True or false? Well, let's say you think that's true, but then Donnie the atheist asks you why you believe what you believe. Maybe he goes on to give opposing views. He quotes scientists, shows you documentaries, and gives you what he believes is hard evidence that he thinks utterly destroys your so-called faith. What would you do? Panic? Cry? Run? Or could you definitely defeat Donnie's deficient diatribe, declaring definitive data, duly demonstrating doctrinal dexterity, and dutifully dismantling Donnie's downright dubious demonstrations double time? I'm asking, just asking, 
I mean, you could say you believe the resurrection is true because of the eyewitness testimony, the explosion of Christianity soon after the event, the Roman leaders admitting the tomb was empty, or for a host of other reasons, powerfully presented in debunk number 12. How's that for cross-marketing? Look, bottom line is this. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Titus 1.9 commands, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, it seems to me that in order to do these things, you got to have a strong why behind your what. That's just how it works, people, which means the statement that it doesn't matter why you believe what you believe has been. you can get more information from us up front and then we'll go through the lesson. Um, uh, that's by becoming a what we call a debunk defender. Uh, it's as easy as sending a text message. Uh, if you want to do it now, you can do it now. If you want to do it later, you can do it later. The idea is you're just going to send a text. Uh, that text would be opening your texting app and going ahead and clicking in the number 51555. That is our number. 51555. And the message that you're going to send is adios space frank. Not the word space, just the space. 51555, adios space frank is the message. Once you hit send on that message, you'll get a link back pretty quickly. When you get that link back, you click that link. You fill in whatever information you would like us to contact you through, whether that be email or phone number through text and so forth. You put in whatever information you would like, and we will give you uh, information on things as we have them. Um, we uh, have the way to get our website. We have tons of material available for free on our app, and uh, we have a book table out front as well. But um, some of what we have in the book table is available in digital copy on our app. And so we would invite you to check it out. Um, tons of information on there. And uh, that's how you keep up with us. Uh, download the app on any platform. It's available. It's kind of like a, a apologist toolbox. Our desire is to give you the tools and the resources to be able to defend our faith. Amen. That being said, we can choose to look at things from two perspectives, either from God's perspective or from man's perspective. God's perspective is called theopomorphism. Man's perspective is called anthropomorphism. This cat here, is it walking up the stairs or down the stairs? Depends on your perspective. Um, how many of you see the 20 dots on the screen? Two of them are going around. I want you to do me a favor and I want you to stare at the cross in the center of the screen and watch what happens to the dots. How many of you see only two dots now? So changing our focus can change our perspective. And so the idea is that I want to spend a few minutes looking at things through the lens of scripture. That needs to be our focus. It is the foundation. We just sang about it. The last line we sang in worship today is, for the Bible tells me so. And if God has said it, that should settle it. Amen? Uh, for this talk, we're going to be talking about identity. I'm going to define the word for you. This is from Oxford Dictionary. Identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. In other words, factually, we are what we are. Who defines what, who or what we are. The answer to this question can lead us into two very different directions. Many people feel that when it comes to identity, we are free to choose whatever identity we want, and this can lead a person into what we have deemed in culture today as an identity crisis. An identity crisis is a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. So although we can become uncertain or confused, God cannot because he is all-knowing and he has laid it out from the foundation of the world. And that is because our knowledge is finite and sinful at its core. God is perfect and without sin. And so therefore, we're going to look at some of the top 10 identity struggles 
that young adults struggle with. And once again, we're going to go through this pretty rapidly. And some of you may be thinking, well, I'm not a young adult. Can you do me a favor? Could you please help me reach the young adults? Because that's where we're losing 78% of them. Amen? So, uh, physical ability, mental ability, economic status, nationality, physical appearance, sexuality, gender, race, social group, religion. These are the 10 categories that we find most young adults struggling to find their identity in. So within all of these things, we once again can choose to look at things through God's perspective or through man's fallen perspective. 1 Kings 18.21 Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered not a word. You know why? Because they were confused. They didn't know. God threw down the choice before them. Either do it my way or do it your own way. But just make a choice. Joshua 24, we all know this one. Verses 14 and 15, therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served before you on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was bringing people to this idea of having to make a choice whose perspective they were going to live from. So I want to dive in and look at some of these. And we're going to start with physical ability. Because the world tells us that we got to be the strongest or the fastest. That we got to be able to accomplish physically anything. In fact, it's sad. The church is no longer the most attended institution on Sundays. The gym is, statistically. That's factual. And and so that's the world's dichotomy. Or maybe you were brought up in a place where if you can't do what everybody else can do, you don't fit in. Uh, I can't surf to save my life. And I was raised in Hawaii. 54 years I lived there. And and, and I can't surf. So you always kind of felt like an outsider. Uh, Or maybe it's being... uh, very fast or or in having a lot of endurance. Uh, But these physical things are something that teens struggle with, not being able to do what other people do. But I remember a story about someone who was the man, but he got conquered by a little boy. Everybody remember? Right. Uh, David and Goliath, 1 Samuel chapter 17, David said to the Philistine, who was the man, right? He, he, He was the warrior, And David says, you come to me with sword and spear and with javelin. In other words, you got your skill set. But I come to you with one thing. The name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and I will take your head from you. We know the rest of the story. David picks up five smooth stones. He only needed one. Throws it. Hits the giant in the head, giant dies. Then he runs up to the giant, takes his own sword, draws it, and he says out of its sheath, and he kills him, and he cuts up off his head, and he holds his head up to everybody, and he says, here's where your physical ability got you. Because you can have your physical ability, but if you don't have the Lord, you really have nothing. And, and David validated that idea. He, he had nothing but God, and therefore... He trusted God, and that was enough. Amen? So we got to be able to teach the next generation that even though we may struggle physically with not being able to do some things other people can do, if we have the Lord, we have enough. What about our mental ability? Uh, Maybe some of you are in here who uh, were on the honor roll all the time. Anybody? Good. We had some smart people in the room. Um, I I graduated with a 1.2 average. I'm not even exaggerating. Yeah, horrible. I was expelled from two local high schools. And then I got saved. God did something pretty amazing. And and I graduated college with a 3.95. What's the difference? Well, Jesus, you know what I mean? So uh, anyway, uh, but I wasn't one of the smartest. Uh, Maybe you can solve a Rubik's Cube in 3.9 seconds. Anybody in here can do that? The only way I can solve a Rubik's Cube is by breaking it and putting it back together again. Anybody still do that? Good, I'm not the only one. Uh, maybe you memorize more scripture than anybody else in your Awana class. 
And, and hear me clear, I taught Awana for eight years. So I'm not downing Awana. What I am saying is this, I knew youth who memorized hundreds of verses and then became adults and lived none of them. So what was the point? We, not, we cannot be memorizing for a little sticker. We need to hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him. Amen? Proverbs 3, 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And I'm going to interject here. Does that mean we shouldn't strive to be physically healthy or mentally sharp? No. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is though, when that becomes the focus, our perspective can change to a way where we're seeing things from the world's perspective rather than from God's perspective. Well, maybe it's our economic status. Uh, maybe it's the amount of money that we have because that's something that as they're graduating high school, youth really struggle with. Maybe we have to be the one with more money than anyone else. And maybe that, that's our thing. Maybe we like the things that money can buy. The nice car, the nice clothes, the things associated with that. And once again, there's nothing wrong with having money. It is wrong when money has us and it becomes our, our God. Maybe we don't have money, but we wish we did. And that becomes our all-consuming thing. Be careful because we really can miss out on some of the things God has because God is not interested in finances for the sake of finances. He gives us finances to use to bring him glory. In fact, Hebrews 13, five, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then first Timothy, this is one of my favorite verses, Six, uh, six and seven. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm going to paraphrase that according to Frank's paraphrased version. If you have Jesus, you're rich. That's what that is saying. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can take nothing out. My wife and I just pretty much sold everything we had in Hawaii to move to the mainland to be able to share the gospel with as many people as possible. Last year, we were on the road 310 days out of the year. Is that worth it? Yeah, it is. Don't get me wrong. We, we went and we were able to purchase a small place in Indiana and get, get some things so we can have a livable life when we have downtime. But the idea is that our stuff is not the important, uh, the important thing. Jesus is. What about when it comes to appearance? And the way we look, because that can sometimes really be a stumbling block, especially for teens. Uh, maybe we've struggled with our weight all our life, and maybe we're uh, not in shape. And actually, I'm in a shape. I'm kind of roundish, and that round is a shape. So, so I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but, but maybe we, we've never been normal. And, and, and I, I make fun of this, but it's not really funny. Because if it were not a problem, anorexia and bulimia would not be a thing. And yet so many people struggle with it. Maybe we feel like our clothing is not up to what everybody else's brand name things are. And, and, and we shop at Ross or Walmart, which I do. But, but especially in school, that's not cool. I remember when I was growing up as a child, I had tough skin jeans. Anybody remember those? They were green and maroon, and, and they had patches on the knees, even before they had holes. But, but that's what you wore, because that was cheap. Sears made them, and that's what you got. Uh, maybe we aren't as handsome or as pretty as some of the people around us. And if I could speak to the young ladies for a moment, Photoshop has blown what a woman is supposed to look like. We should be content with the way God has made us. Amen? And, and, and we cannot strive to be this because every picture on the left is a real person. Every picture on the right is Photoshopped. Photoshop means it's not real. Yet, if you look at all the Instagram and Facebook, you have uh, filters on everything. Why? To try and make you look fake. 
And so there's a huge struggle with that. First Peter chapter three, verses three and four. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. I want you to notice the word merely. Should we take a whole presentation on this? So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it today. But maybe we feel that we're more feminine than we should be. Or maybe we feel we're a little bit more masculine than we should be. And that becomes a struggle. Maybe we have friends who identify as something else. And so we feel like we don't want them to be alone. So we have to defend them. Maybe we feel like we have to stand up so people have equal rights. And and let me say this, this is a false equivalency issue. It's not about a right. This is a behavior. And, and, and therefore, we can, we can address it as so. Um, in fact, and, and I'll say this, what we're finding out more and more when it comes to gender dysphoria is it's a mental illness, scientifically and medically. We, we, we know that. It's a struggle with what's going on in the mind, not just the body. And we don't usually encourage people who are struggling in mind things to keep struggling in mind things. If a soldier comes back with PTSD, and that's very real, we don't say you go ahead and have more PTSD. We'll give you medicines to create PTSD and then summon you. We try to help them, true? And so therefore, let's reach out and try to help them. Honestly, love them. Howard Hendricks, Dallas Theological uh, Seminary professor said, people could, uh, don't care what you know until they know that you care. And so this last slide I had is one of the struggles we have is maybe we should stop hating people who have struggles and honestly love them as Jesus loved them. And I'm not saying embrace their sin, but I am saying that we should embrace the person because we were all sinners. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Only two genders are mentioned. Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. And all we are is the work of your hand. God has made us as we're supposed to be. And so therefore, we cannot pick and choose because he has already assigned our identity in regards to gender. What about race? Uh, Because today we're really struggling with this one, especially in our country. Maybe we feel that we've been judged by the color of our skin, which is which is wrong. And and in fact, if we want to get technical, we're all from one blood, and we're all actually one color, brown. We're just different shades of brown, but we're all brown. Nobody's all the way white, and nobody's all the way black. Amen. And and, and I love what Crayola did. Crayola came out with the colors of the world to color skin tones on people. No black, no white crayon in the box. Just shades of brown. Because that's what we actually see. Maybe we haven't realized that anti-racism groups can be actually racist. Just from an opposite perspective. Galatians chapter three, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Acts 17, 26, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and he has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings. Ephesians chapter two, read the second half of it. We often focus on the first half that we who were dead in our trespasses and sins, he has been made alive through Christ Jesus. And that's a good section to focus on. But when you read the second half of Ephesians chapter two, it talks about this wall of separation that were between two people, the Jew and the Gentile. And it says because of Jesus' blood, that wall was removed. Either it means what it says or it doesn't. And so therefore, if it has been removed, any effort in reparations means that what Jesus did was not enough. And we have a problem. Uh, Maybe it's a social group we belong to. Maybe we strive so hard to be a part of a social group online, which a lot of times is fake. Maybe we've forgotten that our family is our primary social group. That is the one that God has ordained for us. And I realize there are some families that are more dysfunctional than others, but God has given us one another. And so we shouldn't be worried about what nobody thinks more than what these people around me that God has placed me with think. Amen? 
We should strive for that. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34. Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness. Do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. And I speak this to your shame. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents. Why? Because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Then, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. We all have to see it from his perspective. What about religion? And I would argue there are only truly two religions. What do I mean? Because you, you take war religions class in college and they go through, you know, a good couple dozen of them. Well, I would argue there's biblical Christianity, the one who preaches that Jesus came, died for our sins and rose again from the dead, the only person to do so, and there is false religion. Those are our two. Everything else is summed up in the other category because there's only one person who claimed to be God who defeated death, who rose again from the dead. And this is utterly important. Matthew chapter seven, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. John 14, six, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. Notice the singular articles, the, I'm not one of the, I am the, the only way, the only truth, the only life. My wife was diagnosed with cancer about 16 years ago. And if the doctor came in and told us, and it was brutal to hear, she's doing well now. She's actually here and she's out in the lobby at the book table and such. But when he came in and told us you have cancer, it would have been, if we were looking at things from the world's perspective, what a lot of people were hope, hope is that, well, you just give us options. If the doctor said, well, I'm gonna lay out 50 medicines before you, 49 are going to fail, one is going to work. How many would like that? Nobody. Shoot it to me straight. What do I need to do to survive? And God has shot it to us straight. Jesus. That's what we need. No one comes through the Father except through Him. And so therefore, our identity, if it is in anyone or anything other than Jesus our world will eventually come crashing down. And I want to end with this analogy here. Think about Peter. He was killing it as a disciple. Uh, and, and then he blew it big time by denying Jesus. Not once, but three times. We all remember, right? He, he, he goes ahead and he den denies him. So what does he do? He, he gives up. And he goes back to identifying in a different way other than what Jesus called him to. What do I mean? We pick it up in John chapter 21. It says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called a twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. So notice that Peter had settled back into his world after he had denied the Lord. It goes on. He says to the group of people, I'm going fishing. What was he supposed to be a fisher of? But he's going back and identifying as a fisher of fish now. I'm going back to fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. We cannot underestimate the power that our decisions have on other people. He led them there. He was the leader. If he had not said this, none of them would have gone. But, but he says, I'm going fishing. They said, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. Now, I believe it was kind of a sarcastic, no. Because if I were a professional fisherman and I had caught nothing all my time fishing, I'd be kind of bumming, frustrated. And then some beach goer comes out and goes, do you got any fish? No, right? You know, at least that's how I, I perceive this story. Uh, have you, do you lack any? And, and the idea is, yes, I lack all because I have nothing. And he, the beach goer, Jesus says to them, cast a net on the right side of the boat. I'm sure this is where the eyes all rolled. Right? Oh boy, this, this beach guy telling us how to fish. 
Okay, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish. See, doing what Jesus says leads to success. When we do it our own way, we come up empty. Remember, he went back to being a fisher of fish, his chosen identity, and and that wasn't what God had called him to anymore. In fact, uh, Peter and the others went back to feeling their identity was up to them to choose rather than God's chosen identity for them. And it's always no big deal until it is. And all of a sudden, Jesus calls him on the carpet. I didn't call you to be fisher of fish any longer. I called you to be fishers of men. Why are you going back to your worldly identity? Matthew 4, 18 through 20, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And so their identity for a while was rooted in Jesus. But then they went back. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I love what Warren Wiersbe says in this passage. The difference between success and failure was only the width of the ship. We are never far from success when we permit Jesus to give the orders, and we are usually closer to success than we realize. We just got to do what he calls us to do and be who he calls us to be. I pick up in John 21, verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John writing about himself. He says, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it. That's a key part of that verse. And he plunged into the sea. It's interesting because the outer garment, uh, something similar to this is what Peter had took off. Because he went back to fishing and he was getting comfortable there. When I go over to, now that I'm not in Hawaii, where I actually wear jackets. When I go over to somebody's house and I go in their house, I take off my jacket until it's time for me to leave. And then I take my jacket back and I put it on because I'm leaving. Well, when we take it off, it's because we intend to stay there for a while. So Peter had every intention of just remaining a fisher of fish. But all of a sudden, when he sees that it's the Lord calling him out, he recognizes there's no going back. And because there's no going back, he does something interesting. Look at what it says. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And then John 21 goes on. He said to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. Jesus uh, then tells him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. It's interesting because Peter sinned, 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 and Jesus forgave, forgave, forgave. Because he's gracious that way. And so in the passage that we read, Peter puts back on his outer garment and dives back into the water to swim to Jesus. You know why? Because now he's totally forgiven. And he knows it. And he's not going back to the way things were. He's going to stick with Jesus' plan. So maybe we just need to quit fighting God. Let go of the rope. We're not going to win. If he has given us our identity in him, we should embrace that. Maybe we need to put on our outer garment... And leave everything that he's called us to leave behind. Psalm 100 verse 3 and B. Know that the Lord, he is God and it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. And it starts by us bowing our knee at the cross of Christ. Amen? Because he's told us who he wants us to be in his word. Are we willing to do that? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for who you are and who you defined us as, children of the most high God. And you were willing to throw down and come to this earth and die for us to redeem us from our sinfulness. 
and you made us your children. For that, we are grateful. Help us to identify in you so that the world may see that there is forgiveness of sins offered in one name and one name only, Jesus. May you receive all glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, invite you to check out the app if you have the opportunity. Because we have a limited supply of books because of a shipping error, if anybody sees anything on the table and we run out of copies, if anybody's interested, you can write your name and address down and order it through our site or you could pay up with April and we will mail you and we will eat the shipping ourselves um, because we, we, we're missing a whole big box that didn't come on UPS when it was supposed to. That being said, thank you for the opportunity to be with you again today. God bless you all. Good morning again. Um, as Frank heads to the back and gets to his table, we'll give him a minute to do that before he gets flooded. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray for you guys again because you can't pray too much. Amen. Oh, stand with me as we pray. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Dear Lord, I thank you for today, and I thank you that we have Frank here today sharing this powerful message, Lord, and um, teaching from your word, teaching these, these important matters that we need to hear. Lord, I pray that as we go out today that we would consider what he said, that we would actually take advantage of the fact that we get to be here and that we get to be, we get to be a part of this church service, of hearing your word, of being with it. Lord, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it is your word that makes us wise for salvation. And Lord, I thank you so much that we even have the opportunity to read it and to hear it, Lord. I pray that you would continue to bless us this week, that you would bless Frank as he's going to teach three more services, and that you would bless those that come in. In Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome to Candlelight Christian Fellowship. We are so glad you are here with us today. Join us now as we study the Word of God. Everyone, would you stand with us as we worship the Lord?
my sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Bible is true. 
Lord, that your word was passed down faithfully, that not a jot or tittle is out of place, Lord God, but everything that you want for us is there. Father, I ask that we would have faith in that, we would trust in that. And Lord, what a blessing to know that it tells of Jesus, it tells of the blood of Jesus, the only thing that could ever save, Lord God. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we give you all the honor and all the glory. And we thank you for this time that is a blessing to us, Lord God, but I hope even more a blessing to you. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please be seated? say, g'day mate. Summer is fast approaching and do you know what that means? It's almost time for VBS. This year we're taking an exciting journey to the Australian Outback and we're on the lookout for enthusiastic volunteers to join our team and make this year's VBS an unforgettable experience. Our adventure kicks off on July 15th but the planning and setup begin in June and we need your help to bring the Outback to life. Whether you're skilled at crafting, have a knack for administration, or simply love interacting with kids, there's a role for you. So, are you ready to join us on this wonderful and wild adventure? Don't miss out on the opportunity to be a part of something truly special. Sign up online under Serve and then VBS and join our Zoomerang team. Let's make this year's VBS the best one yet. See you in the Outback. Hi Candlelight family, I just wanted to let you know we are safe and sound in the beautiful city of Jerusalem. We'll be home in a couple of days, we're still delayed, but we have a flight, we have everything scheduled, and we are just so excited to be here sharing with the people and today sharing with you. Frank Figueroa is going to be our guest speaker today. Hey Frank, I'm sorry I'm not there to be with you, but in the providence of God, we had you scheduled and God did everything from before the foundations of the world. And we know that you were planned to be there and I was planned to be here in Jerusalem, where from this place we go into all the world with the gospel. From Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful Sunday morning. I'll see you Wednesday night. It's still dark. Oh, there we go. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Jason, one of the pastors here. If you're a first-time visitor, I would like to extend a special welcome to you and invite you to get a welcome packet from the welcome counter on my right before you leave this morning. There's a card in there we'd like you to fill out and turn that back in so that we can reach out to you. And as you're getting to know us, look online and check out our newcomers classes. You may want to attend and find out a little bit more about us. We try to make that as comprehensive as we can. And then as the Lord leads and you want to connect with us and become part of us, and we hope that you will, then we also have membership classes in a series that is also available for you to sign up online. So I hope you will take advantage of those opportunities. So in a few moments, we have a pretty fantastic guest speaker. I've heard him already once, and I'm going to stay and listen again. But before we do that, let's bow our hearts and pray for our ministries of the week. And then after our fellowship break, Pastor Kyle, and I'm calling him Pastor Kyle, will get up and introduce our guest speaker. So let's bow our hearts just now. Father, thank you for the gospel, which is not ours alone, but it, you have provided that it be preached everywhere. And in our city, we pray for Pastor Paul Peabody. We pray for his congregation. We pray that even this morning, that they would be blessed by a power and an insight and a wisdom that is not of you, or that is not of us, but is of you. <laughs> Let's get that one right, Lord. You knew what I meant. <laughs> Likewise, I also pray for Steve and Brenda Hines, Lord, that they would be blessed with provision and vision and guidance and direction as they serve you on a foreign mission field. And then we're grateful for Kim as she helps us stay in the black, literally, and keeps us on track in our financial accountability. And I pray, Lord, that her ministry and her, indeed her life and home and family would be blessed. Lord, just now we thank you, Lord, for providing a guest speaker for us. So we pray for a double portion of your spirit and an anointing upon Frank as he shares with us. And we pray and believe all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 
So at this time, our children can be dismissed to go to their classes. The youth will be staying in here. The youth will be staying in here because you won't want to miss this. And then for the rest of us, let's get up on our feet, greet one another in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening to Candlelight Christian Fellowship's live broadcast. While our church family takes a break to greet each other, we would like to tell you a bit about ourselves. Candlelight Senior Pastor Paul Van Oy desires for all to grow in God's grace through the knowledge of the Lord. Pastor Paul and our pastoral staff are led to speak the truth in love as they teach about life challenges in today's world. The ministry goal is to teach God's word verse by verse and apply scripture in a way that's easy to understand. Candlelight is located in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on the corner of Highway 95 and Dalton Avenue. We would love to meet you here in person, but realize that may not be possible. If you are unable to attend church at the Candlelight campus, please continue to listen or watch online and spread the word about Candlelight's ministry. If you have a request, we would love to pray for you. Email us at hope at candlelight.org or call us at 208-772-7755. Thanks again for listening. Good morning, Candlelight. How are we today? The first service said the same thing. Thank you, Denise. Well, this morning, as Paul already mentioned, we have Frank Figueroa with us here, and so I'm sure some of you have heard him before. Um, and as Jason said, he did an excellent job uh, last service, so we're going to hold him to that same standard for this service. Um, but he is with Reasons for Hope Ministries, um, and they are an apologist ministry that is all about um, preparing the believer to answer for the hope that is in them, to give a reason for that hope. And specifically um, for youth at this time, as that's just the generation that tends to be falling away. Um, so as he comes up here today, let's give him a big round of applause. Good morning. Super blessed to be here, or as they say where I am from, aloha. Aloha. Uh, yeah, I am from Hawaii, and uh, I have been with Reasons for Hope full-time for about a year and nine months. And in that year and nine months, I've driven 63,000 miles, um, spoke about 340 times to about 30,000 people. And, and the reason is, and it has nothing to do with me, it has to do with God being incredible and opening doors. And so rather than me saying what our ministry is about, I'm going to show you a quick video and let that do the saying for me. Hey, Christian. You're a bigot. Why can't you just let people love who they want to love, huh? Do you realize that it's your beliefs that are causing people so much pain? You're a fool. I mean, show me your God. Where did he come from? Who made him? Ever heard of something called science? And if he's so good, why all the evil, the rape, the murder, the genocide? Oh, you don't know, do you? Oh, there you go. You're, you're going to quote me some old English from a book that you don't even understand. Do you know how many contradictions are in the Bible? Do you really think it hasn't changed over the years? It's a man-made book. Explain to me cavemen, dinosaurs, evolution. Explain to me how all the races of the world came from just two people. And, oh yeah, there you go. You're telling me that you figured out the meaning of life at your age. Come on, give me one good reason why I should believe what you believe. Our desire and reasons for hope to be able to give people reasons for the hope that is in us. We use the asterisk as our symbol because the asterisk usually represents something that is missing from the paragraph or the section you're reading to. If you're reading your Bible and you see an asterisk, you look to a footnote. We believe that Jesus and God's word are often left out of the conversation. And so we want to insert that back into not only some conversations, but each and every conversation that we can possibly have. Amen. That being said, uh, anybody in here a note taker? You are going to get a cramp at best, not be able to keep up at worst. Um, so what I've done is all of the notes that we're going to go through today, I have them available for free on our app. 
Uh, so I will tell you how to get the app in a little bit, but the idea is that it's all available for free. You can still take notes, but this way you're not afraid of missing something. We're going to cover 104 slides in the next 35 minutes. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is the idea that my identity is my choice, debunked. What do I mean? 78% of teenagers involved in church youth groups will stop attending church within two years of their high school graduation. We know this to be true. We are hemorrhaging our teens. Why? Not because they don't know what it is they're supposed to believe, but they don't know why they're supposed to believe it. And so our desire is to answer the why questions. In order to do that, we not only give presentations like what we're going to go through today, and involve the Bible heavenly in our answers for why we do what we do. But we also have come up with these debunked videos. We have 25 of them. 26 is going to drop sometime in the next couple of weeks. But I want to show, share one of them with you this morning. This is number 22 in our series. It doesn't matter why you believe. Debunked. Check this out. This just in, the moon is made of cheese. Bigfoot was seen last night talking with Loch Ness Monster. An alien spacecraft mysteriously landed near Roswell. The Titanic sank. Jesus resurrected from the dead. Abraham Lincoln was an American president. Men can get pregnant. Boop. There are indeed married bachelors and Humpty Dumpty is still on the wall. Did you know all that? Do you believe all that? Do you believe any of that? And the bigger question perhaps is, does it really matter what anyone believes? Well, I guess if you believe it's a good idea to inject lava into your veins to cure your arthritis, it might matter to you that somebody steps in, corrects your thinking, and saves your life by stopping you from actually doing such a ridiculous thing. Point is, wrong beliefs can have deadly consequences. What we believe matters. But I have a bigger question than the bigger question that preceded this big question. A deeper question, perhaps. Why do you believe what you believe? I ask this because your what can crumble in a second if you don't have a strong why, even if your what is right, huh? Yeah. In fact, a large percentage of people are convinced to change their what, not because their what is wrong, but because their why is weak. Yeah. Go ahead and wrap that up and we'll snack on it in a second. For now, let's consider one of the statements I open with and challenge the what with a why. The moon is made of cheese. True or false? False. Why do I believe that, you might ask? Well, because the moon would be far less dense and therefore the Earth's tides would be extremely different. Cheese would have broken apart and disappeared already, and eyewitnesses have been to the moon and brought back rock samples. No cheese. I could go on and on here, but the take home here is you should have a legitimate why behind your proclaimed what, especially if it's important, which takes us to another statement, a statement of utmost importance, Jesus resurrected from the dead. True or false? Well, let's say you think that's true, but then Donnie the atheist asks you why you believe what you believe. Maybe he goes on to give opposing views. He quotes scientists, shows you documentaries, and gives you what he believes is hard evidence that he thinks utterly destroys your so-called faith. What would you do? Panic? Cry? Run? Or could you definitely defeat Donnie's deficient diatribe, declaring definitive data, duly demonstrating doctrinal dexterity, and dutifully dismantling Donnie's downright dubious demonstrations double time? I'm asking. Just asking. I mean, you could say you believe the resurrection is true because of the eyewitness testimony, the explosion of Christianity soon after the event, the Roman leaders admitting the tomb was empty, or for a host of other reasons. Powerfully presented in debunk number 12. How's that for cross-marketing? Look, bottom line is this. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Titus 1.9 commands, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, it seems to me that in order to do these things, you got to have a strong why behind your what. That's just how it works, people, which means the statement that it doesn't matter why you believe what you believe has been debunked. Adios. A lot of information. Some people say it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, but um, we, we, we have 25 of these available on our app, as well as our uh, uh, social media platforms and so forth. So if anybody's interested in finding out more about us, uh, the easiest way to do it is to send a text. If you're interested in doing it now, you can. And if you're interested in just getting the information so you can do it later, you can. But what you would do is you would open your phone and you would open your texting app, whatever that may be. And then in your texting app, you're going to start a new text. As you start a new text, the number you will text is 51555. 51555 is the number. The message that you are going to send is adios space frank. Not the word space, just a space. Adios is the punchline at the end of all of our debunk videos. Frank is me, who you heard it from. So 51555, adios space frank, and you click send. Once you do that, 
you will get a link back pretty quickly. You will click on that link, and once you click on that link, you will put in whatever information you don't mind us having on you and how you would like us to keep in touch with you, uh, you f- whether that be email or text form. And then you fill that in, you click I'm in, and then get debunked, and it'll teach you how to download our app, how to get all of our information. We have tons of materials available for free on our app and our website, and we just want to equip as many people as possible with toolboxes that help us to be able to defend our faith. Uh, it, I invite you to check it out as you can at your own leisure. Amen? Amen. That being said, today we're going to be talking about perspectives because we can look at things from a couple of different perspectives, God's perspective or from the world's perspectives, which ultimately lead then man to having to choose between those two. Uh, When you look at this picture, is this cat going up the stairs or is it going down the stairs? Well, it all depends on your perspective. Uh, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look at the dots on the screen. You will see 20 of them. Two of them are rotating in white. But I want you to do me a favor and stare at the cross in the center of the screen and watch what happens to the dots. How many of you see that it disappears and only two dots remain, the two white ones? You know there are 20 dots there. But focusing on something that takes center stage can change our perspective and how we view things. Today, what I want to do for the next couple of minutes is focus on things using the Bible as the lenses that we look through. We're going to focus our perspective in the things around us and what the world says compared to what God has said in his written word. And in fact, we just sang the last lyrics we sang in worship today was, yes, Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so. And if God has said it, that should settle it. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's what we're going to look at today. For this talk, we're going to be talking about identity and focusing on what God has said in regards to our identity. Um, I'm going to define it for you. Identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. That is the Oxford Dictionary definition. In other words, you factually are what you are. Not what you hope to be. We are what God has made us to be. Uh, Who defines who or what we are? That's the question that can lead us in many different directions. The argument is either God has given us his definitions and we follow that, or we follow something that we've heard along the way and it becomes a man-made definition. Many people feel that when it comes to identity, we are free to choose whatever we want. This can lead a person into what is called an identity crisis. I will define that for you. It is a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. In other words, we as people at times become uncertain or confused. Anybody ever been there? God will not. He is never confused. His word is ever sure. And therefore, when we have to bank on trusting someone or something for who we are, we can choose to trust in people who change or a person who doesn't, God himself. So because our knowledge is finite and sinful at a core, we need to stop thinking of things in, from our own perspective and look at them from God's perspective. There are 10 top identity struggles that young adults deal with. Um, and I got this out of uh, a few psychological books, um, physical ability, mental ability, economic status, nationality, physical appearance, sexuality, gender, race, social group, and religion. Uh, because of the amount of time that we have today, we are not going to cover every one of them, but we will cover most in a very brief but broad sense. Does that make sense? And so we're going to compare perspectives, what God says versus what the world says, and determine who it is we're going to choose to put our faith in. Why do I say that? First Kings chapter 18, Elijah came to the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Because they were confused. They didn't know. They had been brought up in a society that had worshipped false gods. And it's like, now what are we going to do? Who are we going to trust? 
Joshua 24, 14 and 15. Most of you have verse 15 memorized. It says, now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. But if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need to make a choice of who the Lord of our life is going to be. And it's either going to be God or it's going to be someone or something else. So I wanna dive in and look at some of these things that people struggle with. Physical ability. The world has taught us that if we're not the strongest, that we don't mount up to what other people's expectations are. Uh, Or maybe we don't have a skill set that everyone else in our community has. I'm from Hawaii, and the sad part is I can't surf, <laughs> which therefore made me feel like an outsider because I can't do that every, uh, the thing that everything else, everyone else in my culture is doing. And so it made me feel kind of like an outsider. Or um, maybe we were taught that being the most ath- athletic person around um, is, is something that is important. And, and, and that we should, uh, th- this is how we define ourselves. I knew a guy who was the man as far as athleticism went, and he got whooped by a little boy. Anybody remember the story? Yeah. So we, we, have, we have Goliath, who was the fiercest warrior of the time. And you got a little ruddy guy named David. What's interesting is it says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 45 to 47, David says to this Philistine, you come to me with sword, with spear, and with javelin. You are bringing your skill sets that the world says makes you a man. I come to you with only this one thing, with the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and I will take your head from you. We remember the rest of the story. David picks up five stones. He only needed one, but he picked up five. He threw it, hit the giant right in the head, dropped him dead, walks over to the giant, it says, stands over the Philistine, takes his sword, draws it out of the sheath, kills him, and cuts his head off with it. And he holds up his head, and he says, here's what your athleticism got you. Because being athletic without the Lord means nothing. And that's what he was saying. Uh, we also have then, what about people with mental, uh, 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 great mental abilities? And, and, and they're quite smart. Uh, anybody in here, straight A student? This is you? Okay, one, great. Um, <laughs> two, um, I was not, I graduated high school with a 1.2 average. Some of you are like, get him off the stage. I don't want my kids to hear that. 1.2 average, but I graduated college with a 3.95 average. What was the difference? Jesus came into my life between that time. Uh, And and so therefore, I had to relearn how to learn. Uh, But maybe this is this comes natural to you. Maybe you could solve a Rubik's Cube in 3.9 seconds. Or you're like me and you're the person who has to break it apart to put it back together. Maybe you can memorize tons of scripture. And some people will say, well, what's wrong with that? And hear me clear. I taught Awana for eight years, the high school, Journey and Trek. Uh, tracks. I known dozens of kids who memorized hundreds of verses, and then when they were adults, lived none of them. What was the point of that? Hear me clear. I know that we should hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against Him. Amen. Amen. We know that. But if we're memorizing just for the sake of seeming smart and getting a sticker, we miss the point. Missed the point. Uh, Proverbs 3, 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Am I saying that we should not strive to be mentally sharp and physically uh, uh, as, as well as we can be? No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, though, if that becomes our God, because keep in mind, Sunday is, uh, when, when it comes to church, it, uh, church is no longer the number one attended thing on Sundays any longer. 
the gym is. Fact. Why? Because of shows like American Ninja Warrior and all these different types of things that bring out physical abilities. And, and so people put more emphasis in that which is going to die than that which is going to live forever. We have to be careful. What about our economic status? What, what about the fact that uh, maybe we, uh, we've been told that money makes the man? That this is how you succeed in life. And it's kind of interesting. My wife is a school teacher and I was a pastor. Both college graduates, and we made less money than most college graduates I know. And yet, I'm investing in something that's eternal. And, and I'm not saying I'm great because of that. I'm saying God is good because he can make us, he can sustain us, even when we follow him in that way. Uh, maybe we've been told that if you have the nicest things, you'll feel successful. Maybe we don't have a lot of money, but we just wish we did. <laughs> maybe we're that person. You, you, you know, who, who just, we, we feel like we need it. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do we have Jesus? Amen. Then he's enough. In fact, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 7. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm going to paraphrase that in the Frank paraphrase version for you. If we have Jesus, we are rich. That is what that is saying. Amen. And, and for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can take nothing out. So if we have the Lord, we're blessed. And we need to recognize that. Maybe our appearance is something that we struggle with. What do I mean? Maybe we're somebody who struggled with our weight. I'm, I'm kind of chunky. Um, and, and, and I don't say that facetiously. I've always been kind of round, which is a shape. But the idea is that ultimately, <laughs> I, I've, I've always been a little more than what I should be. And, 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 and I make fun of it, but it, I'm absolutely serious in this. And the reason that I'm serious in this is because anorexia and bulimia would not be a thing if this wasn't such a big deal. That we have teens that are starving themselves to try and keep up with what other teens think they're supposed to look like. Maybe we feel our clothing isn't as good as everyone else. We don't get the name brand stuff. We get stuff from Walmart or Ross, which is where I shop. I mean, maybe that's us. Or maybe if I could say to the young ladies in here, you feel like when you see the Instagram person or the person in the magazine that I don't measure up to that. You know why? Because it's Photoshop. Nobody measures up to that. God has made us beautiful and wonderful. He's created us in his image. And therefore, we should embrace who it is that he's made us out to be. 1 Peter chapter 3. Don't let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. I'm going to pause for a moment. Notice the word merely. Therefore, it's okay to try to make ourselves look good. That's okay. God, God allows that. But he said, don't let the focus or that be the only thing you're focused on. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Uh, pause for a moment. Ask a question. How much time a day do we spend taking care of the outside of us? Feeding ourselves, taking a shower, changing clothes, combing our hair, brushing our teeth. How much time do we spend taking care of the inside of us? That we, it seems like for most people, we are spending way more time taking care of the thing that is going to die rather than the thing that is going to live forever, our soul. We've got to shift our focus. We've got to choose whom we're going to serve. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord says to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature when they're, when they're selecting a king because I have refused him. This is talking about David's brother. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God, the Lord, looks at the heart. So maybe we should emphasize that. Maybe we should believe that what's going on in our souls outweighs that which is happening to our bodies. What about when it comes to gender? And I have a whole presentation on this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular topic. Uh, although there's a lot to talk about, I just want to go through a few things. Well, maybe the world tells us that, well, you're more feminine than you should be. Or maybe as a girl that you're more masculine than you should be. And we feel out of place. Maybe 
our friends identify as something else. And they're trying to convince us to accept their lifestyle as their rightful choice. Maybe we feel like we should stand up for people because they're being picked on. And so we got to stand up for them. And, and, and I want to be clear, the more we study the gender issue, and I spent a lot of time on this in my presentation on that, we're realizing that it's a mental illness. Amen. And the reason that I'm saying this is not to, I'm not using a slur. I'm saying that if we really feel we're the wrong gender, but biologically we're, the, we're what we are, something mentally is not functioning properly. And that's real things that we should help. What do I mean? PTSD, that's a real thing. It actually is something that many struggle with. But we don't go and say, right on, you got PTSD. We're gonna give you medication to help you have more PTSD. <laughs> We're going to then have surgeries that create this PTSD thing. We don't do that. What do we do? We help them. And we, and, 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 and we, we help when there's a struggle. In the same way, if we're not addressing it as, as it should be addressed, then there's no way we can help with the struggle. Or maybe, and I want to address this, this is to the church. Maybe we need to stop hating people who view things differently than us. Because we once viewed things different. True? I was a sinner who was lost until God intervened and saved me. It's not by my own doing. It's by his grace. And people need to know that they're loved. We don't embrace their sin, but we can embrace people. And we need to be focused on that. Uh, Howard Hendricks, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, famous quote, one of my favorites. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So we need to care about people, really, and stop throwing them away because they see things differently than us. Genesis 127 and 28, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Only two genders he mentions. Isaiah 64, 8, but now, O Lord, you are the father, we are the clay, you are the potter, and all we are is the work of your hands. We don't have a say in this. God has laid it out. What about race? because that becomes a big deal, especially in our country. Maybe we feel like we've been judged because of the color of our skin. And, and I wanna be clear, I don't believe anybody in this world is black and anybody in this world is white. What I mean by that is, if we hold up a black sheet of paper and a white sheet of paper, nobody is really that color. We're just different shades of brown. All of us the same color, just different shades. And, and, and to validate that, Crayola came out with a box of crayons that's called the colors of the world for coloring people's skin tones. No white, no black crayon in the box. Just different shades of brown because that's not what we see. Maybe we got to realize that anti-racism groups can be racist. And, and, and just from a different perspective. And so we got to see things through God's point of view. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Acts 17.26, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries for their dwellings. Ephesians 2, uh, which we're not going to read, but the idea is this. If you read the second half of Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about a wall separating two groups of people, the Jew and the Gentile, and how Jesus and his efficacious blood being spilled on the cross broke down that middle wall of separation. Either it did or it didn't. And if we have to make reparations, what we are saying is that what Jesus did was not enough. Hear me clear. Should we acknowledge our wrongs as people? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what Jesus did was enough to bring us all into him. Amen? Amen? Maybe it's our social group that we belong to because that's what social media is all about, right? Belonging to a certain social group of people who you will probably never meet in your life. Maybe we need to realize that our family is our number one social group that God has given us. And I will be clear, not all families are equally as functional, but... God has given us our families and our families need us and we need them and we all need Jesus. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33 and 34. Do not be deceived because evil company corrupts good habits. Make sure we are hanging out with people who are godly. Ephesians chapter 6, children obey your parents. Why? Because this is right. That's what God says. Honor your father and mother. And then fathers do not provoke your children, but bring them up. Both of us have to be brought into account because it's easy to say something, but it's quite another thing to live it. And so we need to live what it is that we see scripture saying. What about religion? Because there's an argument that, well, there's so many religions I can identify as a this or a that. I would argue there's only two religious groups. What do I mean? Well, there's biblical Christianity. And then there's one other religion in the world. I'll just call it false religion. We have, we have a choice. Do we believe in the one who has risen himself from the dead? who conquered death, the one who claimed to be God and defeated the obstacle between us and eternal life and then invited us into that, or do we not? Matthew 7, 13 through 14, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. John 14, 6, a lot of people see this as being narrow-minded. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father except through me. One path. And they say, well, that's kind of narrow-minded. My wife was diagnosed with cancer in 2008. And when we met the doctor, we had to face this brutal truth. He could have said, there are 50 different options of medications you can choose from. 49 of which she's going to die. One will work. But I'm going to let you choose because I don't want to be closed-minded. At that point, I was like, doc, just tell me what we need to do to keep my bride here. What do we need to do? And he said, this, well, she, this one will work. And here she is with me. God was merciful and gracious. But I didn't need open-mindedness. I needed truth. And the truth is our identity, if it is in anyone or anything else other than Jesus, our world will come crashing down. I'll close with an example of what I mean. Peter was killing it as a disciple. And, and then all of a sudden, he blew it big time, right? He, he denied the Lord three times. Right? I, don't, I don't know him. I don't know the man, even once to a little girl. John 21 picks up. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself Simon, Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And it's kind of interesting because Jesus had changed his identity. Simon Peter used to be a fisher of fish. Now Jesus called him to be a fisher of men. When everything fell apart, he goes, I'm just going back to fishing fish. I'm going back to who I feel I'm supposed to be. And the rest said that we're going with you also. Do not underestimate how we can influence other people by our decisions. Because I believe if Peter did not make this choice, the rest wouldn't have went. But because he was a leader and he left, the rest left too. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Why? Because they weren't doing what God called them to do. We go on. When the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And I believe it was kind of a sarcastic no. Because if I'm the professional fisherman and I'm not catching fish, I'd be kind of bummed. Right? And, and all of a sudden, this, this beach dweller is out there, and he's telling me, did you catch any fish? I'd be, no, right? At least that's how I would have reacted. So the beach dweller says to them, Jesus, cast a net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. I'm sure this is where the eye rolling came in. You, you know, like, like, you're telling me. And now they were not able, so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. When Jesus gives direction and they are obedient to it, there is success. Outside of that, there was no success. Because they went back to being fishers of fish. Why? Well, because ultimately, Peter and the others went back to the identity that they chose. They thought they were good with that. And it's usually no big deal until it is. 
And now Jesus was going to call them on it, that this was a bigger deal than they thought. Why? Because he had called them to be fishers of men. Matthew 4, 18 through 20, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. So for a moment, their identity was found in Christ. But when everything fell apart, they went back to finding their identity in themselves, their own way. Uh, Second Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. We don't go and change it back. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I love what Warren Wiersbe, one of my favorite Bible commentators said. He said, the difference between success and failure was just the width of the ship. We are never far apart from success when we permit Jesus to give the orders. And we are usually closer to success than we actually realize. We just need to bow our knee to the Lord. I'll pick it up in John 21, verse 7. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, says to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and he plunged into the sea. Well, it's kind of interesting. This is the outer garment that they were talking about. Obviously not one exactly like this, but very similar to this. Um, and, and usually you put on your outer garment when you're choosing to leave a place and not going back. What's interesting is um, when I was in Hawaii, I never wore a jacket. So I never kind of understood this now that I've been in the, the mainland for a little bit and I, I, I'm freezing all the time and I go and I put on my jacket. I go over to somebody's house and I take my jacket off and I put it on their coat rack as long as I'm there. But when I intend to leave, what do I do? I put my jacket back on because I'm not coming back. What's interesting is that most commentators believe this is where Peter has a radical transformation. Because now he puts on the outer coat, dives into the sea. You know why? Because I'm never going back to being a fisher of fish. I'm going to remain a fisher of men because that's what God has called me to. John 21, verse 15 through 17. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He says to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He says the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he's asking him this same question over and over. Do you love me? And he says to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know why? Because Peter had denied, 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 and now he was forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Because God is merciful that way. And so I don't know where we're at. And if you're an older person and you feel, you know what, I'm securing my identity, can you do me a favor and let's reach out to the next generation who maybe aren't? And, and, and maybe we have to tell them to let go of the rope that they're pulling against because we'll never win when we're pulling in, in a tug of war with God. Maybe we need to be willing to put back on our coat and go back to what it is God has called us to do because there's gonna be no success outside of that. Psalm 100 verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God, and it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. He is our maker, and he has determined what we're supposed to be. So maybe we just need to bow our knee and fall at the feet of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you, and I thank you that you are the one who has made me. You are the one who loves me. You are the one who gave your life for me when everyone else just saw me as stuck in sin. And by your mercy and grace, you have given me an identity in you. And so I pray that you would help me to live all of my days for you, according to your plan and according to your purpose and with your spirit's power. And it helped me to be able to share with a world that is largely lost so that they too may know your grace and forgiveness and mercy. Help us to give reasons for the hope that is in us, in the person of Jesus, so that the world too may be spiritually alive. We love you and we praise you and we give glory to you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you this morning. All right, that was awesome, right? Thank you, Frank. Well, 
Uh, stand with me as we pray. We'll give uh, Frank a minute there to get out to his table and then go ahead and take a look at some of those materials out there. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. Uh, I thank you that Frank is here today. Lord, we know, uh, as Pastor Paul mentioned earlier, your incredible providence. Lord, and you brought Frank here today for a reason because we need to hear this. And Lord, I pray as you touch our hearts with this message, with this sincere, loving message of fighting against the world, Lord, pushing away the false doctrine that tries to creep into the church as you prepare us for that. Lord, I pray that as the opportunities arise for us to stand firm against those lies and even to lead other people away from them, Lord, that you would give us the wisdom that your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit would guide each and every word that we say to those people who need to, to hear it, Lord. I pray that today that we would be joyful fellowshipping and worshiping with one another. And I thank you again that we got to have Frank today. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Welcome to Candlelight Christian Fellowship. We are so glad you are here with us today. Join us now as we study the Word of God. Us as we worship the Lord.
jot or tittle is out of place, Lord God, and we can trust in what it says, Lord God, that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us, that you spoke the world into existence, and that even though we sinned against you, Lord God, you made a way. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus, our only hope, Lord God, the only righteousness that we have. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we give you our thanks, our gratitude, and our worship. We 
we love you and we praise you, giving you all the honor and all the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please be seated? Hey there, or maybe I should say, g'day mate. Summer is fast approaching, and do you know what that means? It's almost time for VBS. This year, we're taking an exciting journey to the Australian Outback, and we're on the lookout for enthusiastic volunteers to join our team and make this year's VBS an unforgettable experience. Our adventure kicks off on July 15th, but the planning and setup begin in June, and we need your help to bring the Outback to life. Whether you're skilled at crafting, have a knack for administration, or simply love interacting with kids, there's a role for you. So, are you ready to join us on this wonderful and wild adventure? Don't miss out on the opportunity to be a part of something truly special. Sign up online under Serve and then VBS and join our Zoomerang team. Let's make this year's VBS the best one yet. See you in the Outback. Hi, Candlelight family. I just wanted to let you know we are safe and sound in the beautiful city of Jerusalem. We'll be home in a couple of days. We're still delayed, but we have a flight. We have everything scheduled, and we are just so excited to be here sharing with the people and today sharing with you. Frank Figueroa is going to be our guest speaker today. Hey, Frank. I'm sorry I'm not there to be with you, but in the providence of God, we had you scheduled, and God did everything from before the foundations of the world, and we know that you were planned to be there, and I was planned to be here in Jerusalem, where from this place we go into all the world with the gospel, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful Sunday morning. I'll see you Wednesday night. Good morning, Candlelight. How are we today? That is the loudest response I've gotten all day. If you are new with us this morning, welcome. Uh, we invite you to go out to our lobby sometime. If you go to our front desk and pick up a newcomer's packet, there's all sorts of information in there. Um, but specifically, I want to bring up the little communication card that's in there. If you fill that out and return it to us, it allows us to reach out to you to say hi and to hopefully get you connected somewhere here at Candlelight. We also have a newcomer's class. Um, and so if you're new with us, uh, we recommend going to that. It allows you to get to know us a little bit better, more of what we believe, some of the ministries that we have here at Candlelight, and you can meet some of the staff as a part of that as well. And then we also have a membership class. Uh, so if you've been coming here for some time and, and you're considering that membership or you're not really sure what it looks like, uh, go to that class and, and find out what it looks like and then uh, prayerfully consider if that is where God is leading you. Right now we are going to pray for our three ministries of the week. So let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you so much that you have provided this time for us to worship you and to praise you, Lord, that we get to sing songs to you. And then now, Lord, as we have Frank coming up today to teach us, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, and just speak through Frank today. Lord, I pray for Pastor Paul Peabody at Grace Bible Church, that you would be with him and bless him in his ministry that you would provide for that church and all of the needs that they have, Lord, um, that you would just, you know, you, you are the one who provides, Lord, and we know that you know exactly what they need. But bless Paul and bless his family as um, they continue to lead there and as they continue to serve you. And Lord, we pray for Steve and Brenda Hines. Lord, I pray that you would use them, that you would continue to use them just to spread your word and to be lights in this dark, dark world, Lord. Bless them. Let them have a, uh, a wonderful trip home, as I know they're coming to visit soon, Lord, and continue to provide for them and bless them as they are on the missions field doing the work of the ministry, Lord. And Lord, we pray for Kim, who <laughs> makes sure that we have enough money to run the building, Lord. And we thank you so much um, that she is here and that she is helping us with those things so that we can continue to, to do ministry, Lord. I pray that you would bless her, bless her hand as she helps us and bless her family and just bless her this week. And in Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, before I dismiss the children, um, I'm going to introduce to you Frank Figueroa, uh, who, as Paul said, is here this morning, and we're so thankful for the providence of God, as Paul can't be here. Um, but we do have Frank, and I've, I've heard him speak, and it's great. 
so you guys are in for a treat. Um, but Frank works with uh, Reasons for Hope Ministries. Um, they are an apologist group, and they go around and they, you know, teach people how to answer the questions. Um, because when people ask us why there is hope in us, we're supposed to give them an answer. And so that's what Frank's going to come up here and talk about a little bit, is he's going to talk about um, one of the things they go over. And specifically, they have, have a heart for young people, as that's the generation that uh, tends to be leaving the church more than anyone. So um, we're going to do our fellowship break, and then he's going to come up here. Uh, but when he does, just give him a round of applause in like a minute and a half. Um, but the children are now dismissed to their classes, and the youth are actually going to stay in here today. So if you're a youth student and you thought you were going to hear Jeff Gambrino teach, um, you're in luck. You get to listen to Frank instead. So praise God. Thanks for listening to Candlelight Christian Fellowship's live broadcast. While our church family takes a break to greet each other, we would like to tell you a bit about ourselves. Candlelight Senior Pastor Paul Van Oy desires for all to grow in God's grace through the knowledge of the Lord. Pastor Paul and our pastoral staff are led to speak the truth in love as they teach about life challenges in today's world. The ministry goal is to teach God's word verse by verse and apply scripture in a way that's easy to understand. Candlelight is located in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on the corner of Highway 95 and Dalton Avenue. We would love to meet you here in person, but realize that may not be possible. If you are unable to attend church at the Candlelight campus, please continue to listen or watch online and spread the word about Candlelight's ministry. If you have a request, we would love to pray for you. Email us at hope at candlelight.org or call us at 208-772-7755. Thanks again for listening. If I turned on my mic, good, good morning, everyone. Or as we say where I am from, aloha. Yeah, I'm from Hawaii, uh, born and raised 54 years, uh, moved to Indiana. So that's how you know God is real because he called me out of Hawaii and I went to Indiana. But um, uh, I, I now travel the country speaking um, for a ministry called Reasons for Hope uh, after the next generation. And rather than explaining uh, what our ministry is about. I'm going to show you a quick video. That way you can understand who we are and what we're about. Hey, Christian, you're a bigot. Why can't you just let people love who they want to love, huh? Do you realize that it's your beliefs that are causing people so much pain? You're a fool. I mean, show me your God. Where did he come from? Who made him? Ever heard of something called science? And if he's so good, why all the evil, the rape, the murder, the genocide? Oh, you don't know, do you? Well, oh. There you go. You're, you're going to quote me some old English from a book that you don't even understand. Do you know how many contradictions are in the Bible? Do you really think it hasn't changed over the years? It's a man-made book. Explain to me cavemen, dinosaurs, evolution. Explain to me how all the races of the world came from just two people. And, oh yeah, there you go. You're telling me that you figured out the meaning of life at your age. Come on, give me one good reason why I should believe what you believe. It is our desire to be able to give people reasons for the hope that are in us in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, we use the asterisk as our symbol uh, for our ministry. An asterisk represents something that's left out of the conversation. If you're reading through your Bible and you see an asterisk, usually it's pointing you to a footnote or something to get more information on that particular topic. Well, um, what we use the asterisk for is we believe that Jesus and God's word are often left out of the conversation. And we want to inject it back into the conversation, especially with teens. If you are a note taker, raise your hand. Um, you are going to either get a cramp at best or you're not going to get it all at worst. So all of the notes in their entirety are available on our app. 
I have all of them laid out there because we're going to cover 106 slides in the next 35 minutes. Um, because of that, all of them are available on the app for free, and you can just help yourself to that. Um, also, uh, today's topic is going to be, my identity is my choice, debunked. We're going to talk about this idea that has been going around saying that we as people have the right to choose our own identity. 78% of teenagers involved in church youth group stop attending church within two years of their high school graduation. This is fact. This is not something that is made up. We know we're losing them. We're hemorrhaging teens. So our desire with Reasons for Hope is to stop the hemorrhaging. Because what we found out is that they know what it is they're supposed to believe but they don't understand why they're supposed to believe it. And so therefore they know the what, but we're failing to relate to them the why. And so I want to introduce you to one of our debunk videos. We have 25 of these that are available on our app and website. Uh, and we debunk a world's um, idea on something. This is number 22 in our series. It doesn't matter why you believe. Debunked. Check this out. Maybe not. <laughs> Let me try this again. It's still there. Here we go. Let's see if it plays. There we go. This just in, the moon is made of cheese. Bigfoot was seen last night talking with Loch Ness Monster. An alien spacecraft mysteriously landed near Roswell. The Titanic sank. Jesus resurrected from the dead. Abraham Lincoln was an American president. Men can get pregnant. Boop. There are indeed married bachelors and Humpty Dumpty is still on the wall. Did you know all that? Do you believe all that? Do you believe any of that? And the bigger question perhaps is, does it really matter what anyone believes? Well, I guess if you believe it's a good idea to inject lava into your veins to cure your arthritis, it might matter to you that somebody steps in, corrects your thinking, and saves your life by stopping you from actually doing such a ridiculous thing. Point is, wrong beliefs can have deadly consequences. What we believe matters. But I have a bigger question than the bigger question that preceded this big question. A deeper question, perhaps. Why do you believe what you believe? I ask this because your what can crumble in a second if you don't have a strong why, even if your what is right, huh? Yeah. In fact, a large percentage of people are convinced to change their what, not because their what is wrong, but because their why is weak. Yeah. Go ahead and wrap that up and we'll snack on it in a second. For now, let's consider one of the statements I open with and challenge the what with a why. The moon is made of cheese. True or false? False. Why do I believe that, you might ask? Well, because the moon would be far less dense and therefore the Earth's tides would be extremely different. Cheese would have broken apart and disappeared already, and eyewitnesses have been to the moon and brought back rock samples. No cheese. I could go on and on here, but the take-home here is you should have a legitimate why behind your proclaimed what, especially if it's important. Which takes us to another statement, a statement of utmost importance, Jesus resurrected from the dead. True or false? Well, let's say you think that's true, but then Donnie the Atheist asks you why you believe what you believe. Maybe he goes on to give opposing views. He quotes scientists, shows you documentaries, and gives you what he believes is hard evidence that he thinks utterly destroys your so-called faith. What would you do? Panic? Cry? Run? Or could you definitely defeat Donnie's deficient diatribe, declaring definitive data, duly demonstrating doctrinal dexterity, and dutifully dismantling Donnie's downright dubious demonstrations double time? I'm asking. Just asking. I mean, you could say you believe the resurrection is true because of the eyewitness testimony, the explosion of Christianity soon after the event, the Roman leaders admitting the tomb was empty, or for a host of other reasons. Powerfully presented in debunk number 12. How's that for cross-marketing? Look, bottom line is this. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Titus 1.9 commands, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And Colossians 4.5-6 says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, it seems to me that in order to do these things, you got to have a strong why behind your what. That's just how it works, people, which means the statement that it doesn't matter why you believe what you believe has been debunked. Adios. from a fire hose. A um, lot of information really quick. We actually have 25 of these. 26 is going to drop within the next couple of weeks, and it's going to be entitled Hell is Not Real Debunked. And so we, we, we try to take on the topics that people are giving 
as excuses not to trust the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you want to know more about our ministry, I'll share this up front. Uh, it's as simple as sending a text. What do I mean? Well, you would just open your texting app and you can do that now or you can write down how to do it if you'd like to do it later. Um, but you would send a text. You would open your texting app, start a new text, and you would text the number 51555. That is our number at Reasons for Hope. The message you're going to send is adios space frank. Not the word space, just a space. So 51555 is the number. Adios space frank. Adios is the punchline at the end of all of our debunk videos. And frank is me, who you heard it from. And you click send. Once you click send, you will get a link back pretty quickly. Once you get the link back, you click on the link and you fill in whatever information you don't mind us having on you. Uh, whether that be email or phone number. And then you go ahead and click get debunked and it takes you in and it shows you how to download our app, how to uh, access the, the numerous resources that we have available for free that are all available on our platform, including all 25 of the debunk videos that you could share on social media or share with your family and friends. Amen? So uh, get the app. That is the best way to get all the information that we have. We do have a book table out front if you prefer hard copy stuff, but you can go out there and do that as well. Today, we're going to be looking at things through a perspective, whether they be God's perspective or from our own perspective. What do we mean? This cat here, is it walking up the stairs or is it walking down the stairs? Some of you are like, no, I'm not sure. It depends on your perspective. Uh, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look at the dots on the screen. There are 20 of them, two of them brighter than the others. How many of you see all 20? Okay, good. Now I want you to do me a favor and I want you to stare at the cross in the center of the screen. How many do you see now? Most people will start to adjust and they will only see two. Because when we focus on something that is primary and in the center, our perspective can change. So therefore, I want us for the next few minutes to focus through the lenses of one primary source, the word of God. And we're not going to focus on what the Bible, uh, sorry, uh, others say. We're going to focus on what the Bible says. And we're going to focus on how much it can mark us and change us. Um, for this talk, I'm going to be talking about identity because this is where a lot of the youth are struggling today. Uh, in order to define that, I'll put up the definition from Oxford Dif Dictionary. And identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. In other words, we factually are what we are, not what we hope to be. We just are what we are. Uh, who defines who we are or what we are? Now, that answer can lead us into many different directions because it comes down to authority. Who is the authority over our life? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ or someone or something else? Many people feel that when it comes to identity, we are free to choose whatever we want, and this can lead a person into a state of confusion or what is called an identity crisis. I'll define that for you. It is a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. So we can become uncertain or confused because we're sinful. True? God cannot. He is certain and he is sure. And if he has spoken on it, it will be. In fact, we as people often make mistakes because our minds are finite and, and, and there's sin mixed into our souls from the point at which we're born. But God doesn't have this problem. So what we have to do then is share his perspective to those who are struggling with what or who they identify as. And there are 10 things that teens and young adults struggle with the most. Because of time, we're not going to go through all 10 of them today. We're going to cover a, a, a seven and we're going to cover them kind of broadly because we got to keep up. Uh, at a certain pace. And so we're going to talk about physical ability, mental ability, economic status, nationality, physical appearance, sexuality, gender, race, social group, and religion. And, and we're going to talk about seven of these. Um, but all of them can be seen from a couple of different perspectives. But the Bible knows that. And so it tells us to make a choice. 
which perspective we're going to choose to follow. First Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal or the devil, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. You know why? They had been living in a culture that had largely lost the importance of, the, of, of God being the center. And, and so they were, they were struggling to, to determine who they were going to let lead their lives. Joshua brought people to the same question. Uh, most of us have verse 15 memorized. It says, starting in 14, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. So therefore, we need to make a choice who it is that is going to be the God of of our lives. And we'll dive into some of our topics and we'll start with physical ability. Because the world has said much about this. They said, well, if you're not the strongest person in the world, you're never gonna amount to much. That we physically have to be at a certain point. Uh, or you have to be able to do things that the people around you do. I'm from Hawaii and I can't surf to save my life. <laughs> which, which then made me always feel like an outsider. Because even though I'm in a culture that embraces surfing as a whole, since I can't do it, the culture doesn't really relate to me. It, it makes things different. Uh, some people, it, it's having endurance or stamina, being able to uh, uh, exercise and, and, and run with uh, purpose. And, and, and hear me clear, I'm not saying any of these things are wrong, but I know a guy who was in the prime of his uh, athletic ability, and he got whooped by a little boy. Anybody remember this story? Yeah. Right, so, so we know you got Goliath, who is the man. He is the warrior. He's got the skill set. But this little boy, all he has is God. And what's interesting, it says, David says to this Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with spear and with a javelin. You bring your skill sets to the table for this fight. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You have all that. All I have is God. And we know the rest of the story. He picks up five stones. He only really needed one. He picked up five though, and he put it in his sling and he throws it, hits the giant right in the head. Giant falls down. And then he walks over to the giant and it says in 1 Samuel 17, 51, that he stands over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And he holds up the head and he says, right here's your physical ability. Because physical ability without God means nothing. And, and, and the Philistines needed to get that. And so David demonstrates this in a great way. That he came at it as a, as a person of God, and that was worth more than all the physical ability in the world. But the world doesn't really see it like that. Well, what about mental ability? Being smart, being intelligent, because that's a big deal. Anybody in here, straight A's? Checking. Happy for you, right? <laughs> Me, not so much. I graduated high school with a 1.2 average, not even joking. Um, and and uh, I was expelled actually from two high schools. And in college, I graduated with a 3.95 average. What was the difference? Jesus. Jesus. And, 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 but I, I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, anybody in here can solve a Rubik's Cube in 3.9 seconds? Because that's what the smart people can do, right? I'm the guy who got to break it and put it back together. Anybody else? Same? Okay, good. I know I'm not alone. Um, or maybe you're super good at memorizing things, even when it comes to memorizing scripture verses. And I know what some of you are thinking, whoa, 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 what's wrong with that? Here's what's wrong with it, is if you memorize it for the wrong reason. I taught Awana for eight years, Journey and Trek, and I know dozens of youth who memorized scripture, and when they became adults, lived none of them. What is the point of that? Hear me clear, I, I understand that we should hide his word in our heart that we might not sin against him, amen? That's, that's, that's biblical. But we, if we're doing it just for a sticker or a prize, and that's the only reason that we're doing it, 
We can be misguided. We have to be careful. Proverbs 3, 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So am I saying that we shouldn't strive to be intelligent or physically fit? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying though is that cannot be the priority. The priority needs to be we are known by him and we know him. That needs to be our focus. What about our economic status? Because as we start to get older, that's where our focus shifts. Uh, Maybe we have to be the one with the money. And the world tells us that money makes the man or the world go round, right? But, But is that really true? My wife and I just sold everything we had in Hawaii. And we've been traveling around this country in a year and nine months. I have driven 63,000 miles spoken 340 times to over 30,000 people. Not because I'm good, but because God doesn't need my money. All he needs is my willingness to do what it is he asked me to do. And and there's tons of opportunity out there. We just gotta be willing to go. Well, maybe we're we're stuck because with money, without money, I can't have the nice things. And and, and nice things, and, and hear me clear, there's nothing wrong with owning nice things. Be careful that the nice things don't own us. That's where the problem comes in. Maybe we don't have any money, but we wish we did. And all of a sudden, the need for more money becomes such a driving force that we start to miss things that are important to get a little extra, like go to church. Just saying, we got to be careful. We got to be careful. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Love this next follow-up, 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 7. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm going to give you the frank paraphrase version. If you have Jesus, you are rich. That is what it's saying. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we could carry nothing out. So so we have to focus on not money, but the things that money can't buy. Because those are the things God is going to provide. Maybe it's about our appearance, the way we look. Because teens are inundated with the fact that you don't measure up because of the way you look. Maybe we've struggled to be fit, to be in shape. I've always been husky. What, what I mean by that, yeah, that's a nice term for kind of chunky, right? You know, but the idea is, and, and, and I tell people I'm in shape because round is a shape. And so I'm, 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 I'm there. And I joke about this, but I, I, I want to be serious for a moment. Yes. Bulimia and anorexia are real things. Real things that real people struggle with because the world is telling them you don't measure up. You don't measure up not only in the way you look, but you don't measure up in the clothes you wear. You shop at Walmart or Ross. I live there. You know, I mean, that's where I shop because that's what I can afford. Or maybe you will never look like these people. What's interesting is these people don't even look like these people. (laughs) This is Photoshop. Young ladies, if I can just be super clear with this, God has made you beautifully in the way that he designs you to be. Embrace that. Embrace that. Because these people, this is not real. This, and yet, Instagram, all over the place, all you have is filters to make us look different. We're not different. This is real. And, and so we have to learn to be stoked with who God made us to be. First Peter 3, 3 through 4. Don't let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. And I want to pause for a moment. The word merely is in there, which means only or don't let that be the focus. So is there anything wrong with doing your hair up and wearing jewelry? No. But if that's where all the focus goes, that is wrong. Because there's something more important that we can focus on. Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Uh, men, uh, the Lord come and says to Samuel as they're trying to select a new king and they, they, they see uh, David's brother. He says, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So I'm just going to ask a serious question for a moment. 
How much time do we spend a day taking care of the outside of us? Feeding us, combing our hair, taking a shower, changing clothes, exercising, doing the outside of us. And everybody kind of has an idea, huh? maybe about this much time. I, I, try, I try to walk four to five miles every day. That's kind of my thing. And then I've discovered that when you live in the mainland and there's this thing called winter, that becomes brutally hard. But, but I've, I, I've tried my best. And, and, and anyway, go back and think, how much time do you spend taking care of the inside the soul per day. Because we spend way more time, if we're honest, taking care of the part of us that's going to die than we do taking care of the part of us that will live forever. Amen? And if we can't say amen, we got to say ouch. Because sometimes that hurts. And, and so, so the idea is, yeah, we got to shift our focus, our, 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 our perspective. What about gender? When it comes to gender, well, and I have a whole presentation on this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but, but I, I want to address a few things. Maybe you feel or the world has said that you're more feminine than you should be. Or maybe the world has said that you're actually more masculine than you should be. Maybe we're not understanding who God made us out to be. Maybe we have friends who identify as other genders and they're trying to convince us to accept a lifestyle choice. Maybe we feel like we have to stand up for people because they're getting picked on and, and, and they're discriminated against. And I, and I want to keep in mind, there is a false equivalency that is happening in this argument. People are saying that it's a genetic thing. It's not. Science can prove that. I have that in my presentation. But I want to say what I think it is. And I think science is bearing this out as we go. The gender dysphoria that people are going through is a mental illness. The reason that I say this is it's not that their bodies are physically wrong. Something's going on with the mind that makes them think their bodies are physically wrong. And it is a real thing. What I mean by that is there's really a struggle in the mind. The same way a soldier who comes back from war deals with PTSD, and that's a real thing. And, and, and as someone, my wife was diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer in 2008. And I went through some incredibly rough times emotionally. And, and she's well, she's here today. God was merciful in that. But I struggled a lot. And yet in my struggle, nobody said, just let, you, why don't you just embrace the struggle, man? Why don't you just stay there? Nobody says to somebody with PTSD, that's awesome that you have PTSD. And we're going to let you not only keep the PTSD, we're going to give you medications to cause more t PTSD. And then we're going to do surgeries to bring out all the PTSD-ness. We don't do that. You know why? Because we realize it's a struggle. And so we help them out of it rather than expecting them to embrace it. And as science goes on, we're going to see this bear out. And, and therefore, I want to bring up this, this last one. Where we're failing as a church, and not necessarily this church, but the church as a whole, is because we have been conditioned somewhat to think that if people are different, it's okay for me to hate them. And that's not true either. Because I was different than Jesus because I was a raging sinner, and he was perfect. And yet he loved me. He did not love my sin. And he called me out on it. In fact, I got saved after someone shared with me 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. These people do not make it to heaven. And I was one of those people. And yet, even though I was one of those people, he loved me. And, and so therefore, I need to be loving other people and not cast them away. Genesis chapter 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created him. Only two genders are mentioned. We don't see more than that. Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O oh Lord, you are the father, we are the clay, you are the potter, and all we are is the work of your hands. God has made us, and God doesn't make mistakes. Are there some genetic defects that happen in some people? Yes, but that's sin. And God still loves that person and desires them to see fulfillment in him. Amen? Maybe it's our race. What do I mean by this? Because we're sharply divided in our nation when it comes to race. Uh, people have been taught to view other people by the color of their skin. And just so we're clear, I don't believe we're different colors. 
What I mean by that is we're all brown. We're just different shades of that brown. And some people will argue, if I were to have a completely black sheet of paper, nobody is that color. Or a completely white sheet of paper, nobody is that color. Crayola had it right. They introduced colors of the world for coloring skin tones on people. No black, no white in the box. Because we're not. We're not. So so we have to see things as they actually are from God's perspective. Maybe we haven't realized that there are some anti-racism movements that are equally as racist. Just from another perspective. Because we're looking at people because of color rather than through the lenses of the eyes of the Lord. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Acts 17, 26, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell in all the face of the earth. You and I have the same set of parents, if you trace it back far enough, that we all belong to a family together. There's only one race, the human race. Amen? Uh, and, and, and if you want to get into the technicalities of what is being argued in the racist argument today, I, would, I, I strongly encourage people read Ephesians chapter 2, the second half. It talks about how Jew and Gentile were separated with a wall of separation that was between them. But because Jesus died on the cross and shed his efficacious blood, he broke down that middle wall of separation so that now the races are brought together. Either what this says is true or it's not And if we're saying that we need reparations to fix the problem, then what we're actually saying is what Jesus did is not enough. Hear me clear. I am not saying that we should not acknowledge our sin and our wrong because we have sinned and we have committed wrong against each other on a number of levels. But I am saying the fix is not going to be us because we are sinful. The fix is Jesus. And that's what people need. Maybe it's our social group. Because we spend so much time online trying to fit in with people, most of whom we'll never ever meet. You know, but but we want to fit in with that group so bad. Maybe we have forgotten that our family is the primary social group that God has given us. Hear me clear. There are levels of functionality within families. I understand that. But God has given you them and them you, and we need each other, but we need Jesus. So we need to be People who are intentional about our families. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 to 34. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Watch out who we link ourselves with. Ephesians says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? Because it's right. Do what God says because it's right. Honor your father and mother. It then goes on and says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't be the reason they rebel. Both of us need each other and we need Jesus. And that needs to be brought in. What about religion? And I was talking to someone outside about this after last service. And and I made this comment, and so I wanted to explain it a little more. I I, I said that there are actually only two religions in the world. That there's only two choices. And some people go, what are you talking about? I took world religions class, and there were dozens of them mentioned. Well, I would argue there's biblical Christianity. That is one of the religions. And then there is false religion. The reason that I would argue that is because of what Jesus did. There's only one person who claimed to be God, who rose himself from the dead, who conquered death. Only one. Amen? Amen. And therefore, to me, there is one true religion that leads to a relationship with the Lord. And there are all the other ones that don't. Matthew chapter 7 Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Well, that seems kind of closed-minded. You want to get more closed-minded? Let's read what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He eradicated every other possibility. And some will say, well, this is narrow-minded to its core. But sometimes we need narrow-minded. I told you my wife was diagnosed with cancer. When we sat down and heard those words, it was devastating to me. And the doctor could have said, well, you got your choice of 50 different medications out there. One of them will work. The other 49 won't, and she'll die. Take your choice, because for me to suggest one would be closed-minded. Nobody would do that. I'm like, bro, you need to just tell me what I need to do to save my bride. 
And, and what, what do we have to do? Narrow it down. And so the doctor, because of her expertise, expertise and God's grace, shared the path that we were to go on, and it was an eight to 10 year path. So it was a brutal time, and yet she's here with me today. It's kind of why we can consecrate ourselves to doing ministry, because we can't have children, but I can invest in other children that feel like they can't connect with nobody else. And, and so that's what I've consecrated my life to, as long as God will allow. Our identity, if it is in anyone or anything other than Jesus, our world will come crashing down. And I want to end with this example. Peter, he was killing it as a disciple, right? He, he, he was doing super good. You, you know, he, he was awesome. And, and he was the lead disciple. And all of a sudden he blew it big time. And he denied not once, not twice, but three times. We all remember, even once to a little girl, right? He, the little girl pressured him out. And he's like, you know, oh, I, I don't know the man, you know? And he kind of freaked out. John chapter 21 picks up after Peter denied, after Jesus died and rose again. And this is what it tells us. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And uh, in this way, he shows himself. Simon, Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel, Can uh, Cana in, Ga in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon says to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are going to go with you also. Two things here. Simon, go Simon Peter goes back to identifying to what he was before Christ. Because Jesus had told him, from now on, you're going to be a fisher of men. He goes, nah, uh, the rug got pulled out from under me. I'm going to go back to being a fisher of fish. And his influence took a whole bunch of people with him. Because they all followed him. He was the leader. So they went out, and immediately they got into the boat that night, and they caught nothing. You don't say. Because all of a sudden, they weren't doing it God's way. And when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, children, do you have any food? And they answered him, no. Now, I don't think it was just no. I think it was no, right? Because if I were fishing all night, and I was a professional fisherman, and I had caught nothing, I'd be kind of salty, right? I'd be kind of grumpy. So this beach dweller comes and goes, hey, you got any fish? And the people on the boat are right, no, right? At least I think that's because they're frustrated at this point. And so he, Jesus says to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Just do what Jesus says and we can be successful. You know why? Because instead of being a fisher of fish, which you went back to identifying as, you need to be back to being a fisher of men. I've changed you. And in short, Peter and the others went back to feeling their identity was up to them to choose when it wasn't. God had already selected their new identity. And it's always no big deal until it is. And right now it was. And so Jesus called him out and he said, haven't I made you fishers of men? And, 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 and think back, Matthew chapter 4 is where they were called. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And at that point, they had their identity in Christ. They were changed. But then when bad things happened, they went back. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, all things have passed away. That's another word for died. All things have become new. We no longer are who we were in Jesus. I love what Warren Wiersbe says. He says, the difference between success and failure was the width of the ship. We are never far from success when we permit Jesus to give the orders. And we are usually closer to success than we realize. Amen. John 21, 7 then goes on. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And this is John, right? Bragging about himself that he figured it out, right? And he, oh, that's Jesus on the beach. And look at what it says. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged into a sea. Outer garment was something probably close to a tunic or something that would, would give him a little extra warmth, a little covering besides just the basic bare essential clothes. I didn't understand this until like a year ago because I lived in Hawaii. And all of a sudden I moved to the mainland and I found out what winter was all about. And I had to wear 
jackets. Because in Hawaii, you don't really got to wear a fat jacket. You know, out here, I'm like, man, give me the thickest one you got. And so, but when you go over to somebody's house, you take off your jacket and you hang it up on the coat rack and it stays on the coat rack until when? Until you leave. And when you leave, you're usually not coming back and you put back on your jacket. My argument as well as the commentators who have dissected this passage is this. Peter here has a change And he says, you know what? Instead of leaving my outer garment hanging on the boat, which I identify in, I'm putting it back on and I'm leaving this boat and I'm never going back. I get who Jesus has called me to be. And that's why we see three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Says to him the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he's grieved. Why ask three times? Because he failed three times. He denied. And so he failed, failed, failed. Now he's forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. All the way forgiven. So he has a choice. He can either keep hold of what it is that he's holding on to, being a fisher of fish, or he can let go of the rope and do what God has called him to be and be a fisher of men. Maybe we need to let go of the rope and just do things God's way. Maybe we need to put on our outer garment and leave with the intent of never coming back to the world and its way of thinking. Psalm 100 verse 3 and B. Know that the Lord, he is God and it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. It is not up to us to choose our identity. We have a new identity and that new identity is in the person of Jesus. Amen? If I can encourage you, there's a whole world out there who does not know that. And they need to. And you're the chosen vessels by which that message is going to come. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love towards us. And we pray that you would help us to be your people. That as we claim the identity as Christians, that it would not just be in title, but it would be in action. And that we would share your truth with a world that is by and large dying. Because they don't know who they belong to. Help us to share truth. Help us to understand how much you loved us. So much that you came and died for us. And then help us to die to ourselves so we can go out there and love like you loved. Pray that you bless the rest of our day and our weekend. And I thank you for the privilege of being a nobody who you allow to be a part of this amazing ohana for a weekend. Bless us as we go out and do your work this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you this morning. All right. Hi, sorry. Well, thank you, Frank. Um, As he heads to the back there, I am going to close us in prayer so that he has a minute to get out to the table before you bombard him uh, with questions and Uh, thank yous and such. So if you guys would stand with me as we pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you that Frank was here today, that we get to hear this wonderful message, Lord. We know your providence, Lord, that you provided Frank for us today because this is something we needed to hear. And Lord, I pray that you would just open our hearts to receive this message and to think on it and to meditate on it. And Lord, to consider how it should affect our lives. Lord, that we would even put on our outer garment and go out of the world and into you. Lord, if we've not done that already. Lord, that you would continue to convict us of the the things that we're struggling with. And Lord, as you prepare us to have conversations with others who are struggling with the lies of this world, or even if we ourselves are struggling with the lies of this world, that you would just allow these materials to be a blessing to us and to help us come to the full knowledge of the truth and even to be able to defend that and to be able to give an answer for the hope that is in us if anyone should ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go check.